Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies may be one of Jesus' most famous and often quoted sayings. For the sayings that we have heard so often, I think it's important to step back and reflect on what this passage is saying to us. First of all, it seems straightforward. There's no reward for loving your friends. There is a challenge, to say the least, in loving your enemies. And God calls us to the more challenging way. In an earlier reflection this year, I mentioned that some of us may be eager for the moral scrupulosity of these difficult sayings of Jesus. What is there to interpret, some might ask. Jesus is very clear, love your enemies. He even concludes by saying, be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Nonetheless, I would like to admit that first, loving your enemies is very difficult, and often it feels impossible. Therefore, as I approach this text, I'm asking two questions. First, what does it really mean to love one's enemy, especially someone who has inflicted upon us terrible hurt and harm? Second, what does it mean to be perfect? Is perfection possible or even desirable? Let me begin with perfection. This topic is very close to me. Are you familiar with the Enneagram, a matrix of nine personality types? Let me encourage you to explore this valuable tool for self-understanding. I am a type one, sometimes called the perfectionist. This is hardly a compliment. While wise and discerning at our best, type ones can also be very rigid and temperamental. For me, personally, the command to be perfect does not sit well and has not yielded moral growth. I understand that everyone here listening doesn't have this concern, but for those of us who do, I think this is very important. St. Ignatius advises us to practice agere contra, going against what we may be inclined to do. And Aristotle maintained that virtue was a golden mean between extremes. To find virtue, we must direct our actions away from our more extreme tendencies. In practical terms, this means that striving to be perfect in the literal love of enemy may be counterproductive and actually fuel our attachment to and obsessions with moral superiority. However, there may be a way around my own distaste for perfection. While we may live by the old saying, practice makes perfect, it is also the case that perfection can make practice. Striving for moral goodness doesn't mean we necessarily achieve it, but our striving points us in the right direction, toward actions and deeds grounded in integrity, love, and compassion. If we take this approach to the saying, what then does Jesus mean by love of enemies? Turn to today's first reading. In his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul writes first of the churches of Macedonia, speaking of the abundance of their joy and a wealth of generosity. Later in the letter, Paul says to the Corinthians, Now as you excel in every respect, in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you, 
may you excel in this gracious act also. Paul is exhorting these Christians to act in generosity with the same fervor for which they strive in faith and knowledge, discourse and earnestness. He adds, I say this not by way of command, but to test the genuineness of your love by your concern for others. What then would it mean for a Christian in the first century to love your enemies? In light of Paul's letter, it seems we are asked to excel in generosity and have genuine concern for others. But how can I act with generosity and offer genuine concern for someone who has wronged me, who has hurt me deeply? I don't think Jesus means that we must always like those who wronged us, but we should offer concern and act with compassion. Responding to others with kindness, directness, truthfulness, and honesty is a place to begin. If these tasks are too difficult, we can practice avoiding gossip or unkind words about others, especially those who have hurt us. We can pray with great sincerity for the grace to give others the benefit of the doubt, to always assume their positive intent, and to strive to see things from others' point of view. Acting with generosity and authentic concern for our enemies is not easy. But it becomes easier if we act from a place of strength, confidence, wholeness, and integrity. As people of faith, we are reminded in today's psalm, the Lord sets captives free. Blessed the one who keeps faith forever, secures justice for the oppressed, and gives food to the hungry. If we trust that God can free us from our captivity in fear, anger, and self-doubt, we can keep faith and live boldly, knowing and loving who we are, living with great integrity, confidence, and pride. From such bold self-confidence flows joy and generosity, graciousness, and authentic concern for others, especially for those who have hurt us and may need this concern and love the most.